One uh, at, a, uh, at a mosque in uh, the northern part of the city, and, and uh, we're told dozens and dozens of, of churches and, and synagogues throughout the city. Uh, we are also told that the uh, USNS Comfort, that, which is one of the Navy's two hospital ships, will arrive in New York at some point today to provide disaster relief. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there will be uh, wakes, obviously, for the various firefighters that are, are known to be dead. Um, I think uh, Miles, probably one of the saddest things I've heard here this morning when we focus in on firefighters, is the fact that uh, firefighters are instinctually trained to, to go for the flames. And uh, I was told that many of these 300 or so firefighters that lost their life probably didn't give any thought because their initial instinct was to save people to what, uh, you know, the, the, the jet fuel that uh, was falling on them meant and, and, and even thinking about the stability of the buildings. Um, Mayor Giuliani expected to hold a news conference. Uh, it has been delayed. We don't know when that's going to come down, but we will go to it live. And, and Miles, there's one other thing I'd like to share with you right now. We have, uh, you know, you're finding about uh, about the wonderful level of support all over the city. But uh, last night, uh, and, and and even today, in this horrific weather, there's a, a park that is about 30 blocks north of the World Trade Center. Uh, which has become a memorial to the victims. And what people have done is uh, spread out big rolls of, of poster paper on the ground. And, and this is at Union Square Park. And, and by the hundreds, New Yorkers have been walking by and um, scribbling messages in, in this uh, constant pour of rain. Such a series of contrasts to report from New York City these days. All right, Paula's on. Thank you. We'll check in with her in just a bit. Um, let's keep it in New York, however. This is day four now, and yet another day. The markets will not open for obvious reasons, an unprecedented shutdown. Uh, Christine Romans is in our uh, financial newsroom with more on that. Christine? Good morning, Miles. For the fourth day in a row, there was no opening bell on Wall Street, and there will be no stock trading. The last time the market was shut this long was in 1914 during World War I. When the New York Stock Exchange shut its doors for four and a half months in response to the fighting in Europe. Officials say stocks will reopen Monday morning and teams are working to get everything in order at the trading facilities. Extensive system tests will be conducted tomorrow, focusing heavily on how communications equipment is functioning. More than 20% of the NYSE's telecom data flowed through a facility adjacent to the World Trade Towers. Local phone company Verizon has been feverishly attempting to rebuild that capacity. So what can investors expect this time Monday morning? Well, some experts are still predicting a steep sell-off in stock prices. They are mainly worried about the economy's ability to stay out of recession following Tuesday's terrorist attacks. But a growing number of analysts say stocks could open flat or even slightly higher. That's because investors have had some downtime to reflect and see that the nation's economy is not in crisis. And some analysts even say a bit of patriotism might come into play. Investors don't want to cause any panic selling. Analysts say an earlier resumption of trading could have caused an extremely volatile atmosphere and may indeed have led to panic selling. Another factor that could help in yesterday's mark is yesterday's market stability in Asia and Europe. Japan's Nikkei average even rallied 4% in Tokyo Friday, but Europe's major markets have not been so lucky. They're moving lower again today, hurt by steep losses in airline stocks. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., bond and commodity trading is underway for the second straight session in Chicago. Short-term Treasury notes rallied initially on the possibility the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates when stocks open after the weekend. Miles? All right. CNN's Christine Romans at the Financial News Desk in New York. Here's a look at the developments to this point for you. We're looking at pictures of the National Cathedral right now, live pictures where President Bush shortly will lead the nation in a prayer service for the victims of the terrorist attacks. That's to occur at 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time. We, of course, bring that to you live as it happens. Earlier this morning, friends of the United States overseas paused for three minutes of silence. In London, the House of Commons paused before an emergency meeting to discuss the attack on America. In Berlin and across Germany at noon, local time, bells rang out at churches and cathedrals as well-wishers observed three minutes of silence. And at noon in Paris, French President Jacques Chirac led his country in observing three minutes of silence. At Elysee Palace, France's Republican Guard played the Star-Spangled Banner. 
And back in New York this morning, the weather not cooperating at all with the search and recovery efforts. We've been telling you this all this morning. Heavy rain will certainly make this hard to even imagine task even more difficult. As we tell you, in a little more than two hours' time, there will be a national prayer service at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Um, among the people who will be participating one way or another is Bishop T.D. Uh, Jakes, who is with the Potter's House. He joins us now to talk a little bit about what Americans can expect in the days ahead and what Americans of faith are thinking right now. Good to have you with us, Bishop Jakes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. What are your thoughts on this day of prayer? I think it's a very essential moment for the nation to come together and come to grips uh, with the presence of God and allowing God's grace and presence to fortify us and undergird us as we're feeling vulnerable and we know that there are many important decisions to be made. We want divine intervention in those decisions. A little while ago, I asked the dean of the National Cathedral um, what the scriptures say about retribution, about the, the desire for vengeance. Certainly, if you look in the Old Testament, there's plenty of examples of vengeance. Uh, do you choose to, to interpret the scriptures that way? Well, you know, I think what's important for us is that, that the Bible says that the powers that be are ordained of God, and it respects the leadership that is in place. And I think it's a strong time for Americans to gather and galvanize around the leadership that we have in place, and they're doing that, that there is a strong solidarity between people of all races, all cultures, and all religions in this country. We're feeling unified like I've never seen before and looking to our government to make the right decisions and appropriate those decisions for the betterment of our nation. Well, what, but specifically, though, what do you tell your flock about the desire for some kind of vengeance? Do you tell them that's inappropriate? or No, no. I, I think that it's more important rather than to be critical of a natural reaction to pain, which is anger. All of us are feeling angry and, and hostility. And the Bible said, be angry and sin not. So it does acknowledge that there is a human reaction where it is natural to be angry. It is a process of grief. And rather than to chasten people for being angry, I think we need to support them and offer solutions that we can disperse that anger appropriately uh, through prayer, interacting with our families, communicating with one another, uh, w reaching out to help people in need, often gives us a sense of being able not only to uh, respond to the crisis, but to help with the solution. Give us a sense of the words uh, that you choose right now when people come to you and say, for one reason or another, they, this whole thing has left them um, questioning their faith and, and wondering how um, a God could allow this to happen. You know, I, I've been quick to respond to that because I think that those illustrations are much more applicable when people are facing a tornado or an earthquake and they associate those issues with God. Uh, uh, but even in those cases, that's not an accurate association, but it does occur. In this case, it is clearly not an issue of man in conflict with God or God with man. This is man in conflict with man. I think Americans understand that this is brought about through the evil and the wickedness of man against man and not an act against God. Our faith is essential because as we face the complexities of how do we protect ourselves and are we really protected sufficiently, there is that divine component of allowing God to be our strength, fortify us, and to lead us into the days ahead. You talk about the days ahead. As the shock wears off and, and the grief progresses into its various stages, uh, it sometimes can be even more challenging for people coping with exactly. this either intimately or from afar. This grief uh, transcends just those who are directly involved. We all are all, after all, affected. Um, what's your biggest concern as time goes on? Uh, you know, I have a lot of concerns. First of all, I don't think we've even begun to grieve. We were shocked at first. Now we're going into an anger, anger stage. Many people in New York and around the world are hoping against hope that their loved ones might be found. So they're suspended. They have not resolved in their own minds that uh, these are casualties yet. They can't really grieve appropriately because there are so many unanswered questions. Who is going to be found? Maybe someone 
uh, escaped the building, has not been notified. And so they're, they're not really entering into true grief yet because they're suspended, which is a very painful time. And during this time, support from family, from churches, from synagogues helped to fortify us. And then after that, we enter into true grief and acceptance if we're unable to find or locate the loved ones that we are waiting and hoping against hope that we might be able to find. Bishop Jakes, I wonder if you could share some words of prayer with us. What, what are the words that are appropriate at this time? You know, I, I would like to take this opportunity to pray, and those that are watching right now, just to pray with you and just to believe God and ask the Father uh, to, to come and comfort in a special way those that are hurting, those that are angry, and those are, that are confused. Father, we seize this opportunity to ask you to just cover with your grace and mercy and love those who are wounded in a way that only you can do on the inside, giving grace and peace to them. We pray for the president. We pray for his decisions, for Congress, that you might lead us into the days ahead with your divine protection. This is my prayer, and I pray it unto the Lord in his name. And I want to invite Americans everywhere, in whatever method you choose to pray, to join us as we seek and call on the name of God to answer and to heal and to lead our nation through the tough days ahead. Bishop uh, T. Day. T.D. Jakes, my apologies. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, really appreciate your, your time and your thoughts and your prayers with us God on this bless day you. of prayer. All and right. God bless America. All right. And just to remind our viewers, in uh, just about two hours' time, that uh, national prayer service at uh, Washington's National Cathedral, Cathedral Heights, Wisconsin Avenue, will be filled with... Uh, all kinds of people, from the president on down, the cabinet, uh, members of Congress. The Reverend Billy Graham will be a, delivering that sermon. We, of course, will bring that to you live so you can join in and join in the prayer. Let's send it back to Paula, New York. Okay, thanks so much, Miles. It continues to pour here in New York City, making uh, already hazardous conditions even worse for the rescue workers uh, toiling in the rubble of the World Trade Center, flags like this flying at half-mast all over the city. Uh, we've talked a lot about how the rain is slowing down the, the search and, and recovery effort, and, and one of the, the more bizarre pieces of information we've just gotten from a Suffolk police officer is that as hard as this rain is making things downtown, is making the debris field very wet, very slippery, uh, the, the dogs who are assisting in the search, uh, their ability to go through the rubble. Apparently, the scent, and, and this is sort of uh, cold, hard stuff to share with you, but the scent of any survivor actually stays closer to the ground because of the water, but that the dogs uh, would be able to, to pick up that scent. Uh, there is still hope that uh, workers and uh, lost uh, in this rubble might be found alive. That is why uh, the rescue earth efforts go on in earnest. Now, uh, it remains to be seen what impact this is going to have on the president's traveling plans after he finishes up at the National Prayer Service at the National Cathedral. He is expected to come here to New York to get his first hand look of uh, what has happened uh, to the city. And Major Garrett now joins us from the White House with more details on that. Is the weather going to change anything, Major? Paula, there's no indication of that now. I've checked with White House sources repeatedly this morning. They say the president still intends to travel to New York City. I've spoken with uh, representatives in uh, the office of Representative Gerald Nadler. He is a Democrat from New York in whose district the World Trade Center resides, what's left of it. They say they have received no word from the White House that the president will not, in fact, carry out with his intentions to travel to New York City after the National Prayer Service at the National Cathedral. So that's where we are right now. But clearly weather is an issue. The underlying uh, thought was that the president would take Air Force One to the general area, then from an undisclosed location, uh, fly by helicopter to see and survey the damage from above. Clearly, if there is inclement weather, that uh, makes the question of a helicopter trip all the more real. But no announcement officially from the White House that this trip, in fact, will not occur. Every indication, both from the Capitol Hill and from the White House here, is the president will, in fact, 
go on to New York City. We'll keep you posted on that. I can tell you at this very moment, the president is meeting with his entire cabinet in the cabinet room here at the White House. It is the first full cabinet meeting the president has convened since the disastrous and catastrophic events of Tuesday. The president is trying to coordinate as best he can all federal relief efforts, which will probably touch almost every agency of the federal government in one way or another. And he can do that now with the confidence that the White House and Congress have reached a deal on a $40 billion emergency supplemental spending bill. $10 billion of that $40 billion will be made av immediately available to the president to use hey, for recovery efforts in New York, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, but most especially in New York City, where the rubble is so incredibly